Well, now they are coming after your filtered coffee. First, it was meat, then it was coffee. The World Economic Forum can't t uh, stop telling us how to live because of climate change. Uh, the, the, the World Economic Forum tells us that it takes 140 liters of water just to provide you with that delicious drip cup of coffee that you love so much every morning. Uh, and the WEF wants to remind you that the most sustainable cup of coffee in the world comes from a lab. In Finland, of course it does. Not a farm. Not a farm at all, naturally. I'm sure Bill Gates is very excited about this, just like his lab-grown meat, now lab-grown coffee. So drink lab-grown coffee, of course, just like eating lab-grown meat. Well, how are we defining a lab? Because isn't a kitchen essentially a lab? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. But we're not making, I'm not growing the beans in my kitchen. Right. I'm not making some sort of a genetically modified bean in my kitchen. Okay. I'm getting it from coffee growers in Costa Rica. It's a lab-grown bean. But you like don't grow your own coffee? In the kitchen? <laughs> you're you're, in, you're, in my you're collecting big oil checks, aren't you? You're I collecting big oil checks, aren't you? <laughs> you need to watch... You need to watch the show Lessons in Chemistry on Apple TV with Brie, Lar Brie I read Larson. I the book. It's a, There's a great yeah, part about the, the coffee. Yeah. Yeah, where she turns, and then she turns the lab, her kitchen into a lab because she can't get a lab. Right. And the so, neighbor's like, yeah. have you ever heard of Folgers? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, drink your lab-grown coffee instead of uh, buying it from coffee growers. You know, these delicious beans that come from Colombia and Costa Rica and... Uh, wherever else you get your beans um, across the world. Vietnam, uh, there's all sorts of amazing beans out there. Last week at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Swiss banker and World Economic Forum agenda contributor, uh, Hubert Keller, sparked some controversy when he said that the coffee that we all drink emits between 15 and 20 tons of CO2 per ton of coffee. Okay, 15 to 20 per one ton of coffee. In other words, he says, every time we drink coffee, we're basically putting CO2 into the atmosphere. Listen. We'll be having our coffee before the session and, and you raised the coffee example. I'd love just to give you the chance to expand on that. Basically, the coffee that we all drink um, emits between 15 and 20 ton of CO2 per ton of coffee. So we should all know that this is every time we drink coffee, we are basically putting CO2 into the atmosphere. Okay. So I take umbrage with that part of his commentary, but we'll come back to something else that he said in a moment that could actually be good for coffee and coffee growers. And frankly, the taste of coffee, which people are ignoring on the internet, they're just focusing on that piece of it. But I take incredible umbrage with that. And I, his, I think that we his other comments cannot absolve him of saying that. Okay, but I think that we should let people know who you are. Clayton is the kind of person who drinks any coffee offered to him, even if it is the disgusting Keurig in the brake shop, the shop that's like fixing your fixing brakes. your brakes. Like, yeah, he will walk. He will not walk past free coffee. So or like, any coffee. Yeah, no, no coffee. He says no to at any time of the day. So we're not talking about, you know. But I do like, love good coffee. I do appreciate a good cup of coffee. But I will drink out of necessity. Necessity. Cr crap coffee. <laughs> at like 5 p.m. I mean, I, at a Pet Boys. Yeah, that is necessity. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, this, I'm the same way. Like I would do, like when I, when I had a drip coffee maker a while back, and it's like I would just, I'd run a full pot, and if I didn't drink it that day, I'd just let it sit there, and the next morning I'd wake up, just pour it in a cup, put it in the microwave, and then off I go. <laughs> That's like what your dad, your, your I dad do, does. I drink leftover coffee. I have no problem with that. Like yeah. Clayton's coffee habits, are, they just never cease. So to I'm very, when I saw this story, I and I dove into the data like, on this. Don't I'm, come for my yeah, coffee. Don't come for my coffee, you were global. Globalists, keep your hands off my coffee. So every time we drink coffee, he says, we're putting CO2 into the air. So let's be precise and do the math, according to Keller, which he said 15, each cup, one ton of coffee emits 15 <laughs> to 20 tons of CO2, according to Keller. Now, according to the data, coffee is the most popular drink in the world. Consumption worldwide actually looks like this. Take a look at the data. This is uh, the most recent data that we have on the amount of coffee. It continues to go up. We drink 176 million bags of coffee per year. And those bags, if we weigh them in the metrics that they're using here, about 60 kilograms. So again, I did the math here. One ton equals 907 kilograms, right? 
well, 10 billion 560 million kilograms divided by 907 kilograms equals 11 million tons. So we drink 11 million tons of coffee each year worldwide. According to him, that's about 180 million tons of CO2 that were then created from coffee every year. Large numbers, of course, sound scary, especially when we don't even know what they mean. Wow, that sounds scary. That's a lot of CO2. That must be awful. Or if they're, is it doing any harm to the planet at all? So if we're talking scary numbers, let's talk about some other scary numbers. Let's talk about the private jets that they took to Davos this year. His one private jet produces between five to 8,000 tons of CO2 per year annually. All the private jets that accounted for over a million tons of CO2 that were at Davos. But no one cares about private jets either. Drink your coffee in your private jet for all I care. I don't care. There's no evidence that it's causing any harm to the earth at all. The U.S. military. You want other scary numbers? Here's a scary number. The U.S. military produces over 51 million tons of CO2 every year. Israel, the bombing of Gaza, has released more CO2 emissions over the past 100 days than 20 countries do annually. That's scary. But let's spend a whole panel discussing coffee and other panels on farming and meat production, which they did this week at the World Economic Forum. But no panels, by the way, on the effects of war. Wouldn't that have been amazing if the World Economic Forum announced we have a whole panel on the carbon footprint of war? They would never do that. Yeah, I would tune Can you in imagine for that? that. I would love to see if they do that panel, but they won't do that panel. Uh, just a reminder. Well, like, well that's... Oh, sorry, but, but to me, this is this is really, really targeting. Like, they're trying to claw back and retarget like they did in the 90s and the early 2000s of pushing the environmental issue onto individuals so that corporations and these these the people that are actually doing the majority of the damage are their hands are clean. So they want to put so it's your cup of coffee that's doing this, not our private jets, not, you know, Nestle, who's like. All over the world is doing as, as many like global or like environmental catastrophes that they can pull off, but that's not the issue. It's you, the individual. It's your cup of coffee. This is the whole like you know, don't run your water when you brush your teeth. Make sure you flip off every light switch when you leave the room because it's it's up to you to save the environment. And there's nothing us individuals. Even if you combine us together, we don't come close to to some of these corporations that are out there doing this. Yeah. Well, that's what we talked about yesterday in Canada, right? That's what the Trudeau government wants you to do, to unplug certain appliances because of rolling brownouts, because it's so cold, the electric grid can't keep up with it. It's on you to keep Canada rolling. Really? Or what about the environmental policies that got us here in the first place? What about Germany, which we're going to get to here in a moment? Why are people facing a climate crisis and businesses have to close in Germany? But it's on you. It's on you, the consumer. Drink less coffee. Drink, eat less meat because of all the water and the energy resources required to get you that hamburger. So just a reminder. Well, I, I was going to, mm -hmm. I was just going to point out really quick that the reason they don't do the, you know, bring light to the military uh, footprint is because it would really only be the United States. We have to be the biggest producer of that anywhere because most of these other countries aren't at war like we are. No, the, unless the, they're at war with us. No, <laughs> right. The U.S. spending and U.S. Uh, military carbon footprint far exceeds any other in the world. So not even close. So they won't do that. So just a reminder that no one has shown evidence, by the way, that an increase in CO2 levels are bad for the Earth. No one. They can't do it. As Professor William Soon explained last week on Tucker. Listen. I've been working on this subject of CO2 causing climate change or what other factors we can ask that cause climate to change. For close to as long as since my postdoctoral year, 1991, right? So it's about 32, 31 years, 32 years. And on this question, I think we have a very definitive answer. What we know now is CO2 ain't going to cause nothing. It's not going to change much of the climatic system, which means it won't change the speed of the hurricane. It won't change the how fast or how frequent tornado form. It won't, it, it won't even actually make any difference to the polar bear population. It's all conservation issue. It won't even cause how much fish you don't catch or catch, you know? It won't even cause what they call ocean acidification. It won't even cause this problem that they claim. It's all artificial. Everything they do, it's all dream from their model and the tyranny of the few again. That those few people just dream up this scary story that is just ain't true. My view is that the UN IPCC, 
United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is one of the primary problems, which means they have been misleading people. They've been using authority of science, which is not true, right? It's all governmental hackers, basically, right? In fact, yes. the evidence suggests the opposite, that a warming earth produces more life, more food, more fertile soil, more abundance. But that's not stopping the climate alarmists, of course, from pushing this anti-meat, anti-coffee, anti-oil, anti-natural gas agenda. <clears throat> here's, the New, here's the New York Post. People should drink less coffee to combat climate change, study says. Canadian researchers analyze coffee's contribution to climate change in a piece published in early January and suggest people moderate their consumption of the popular drink as part of the solution. Researchers said that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Preparing coffee is just the tip of the iceberg. Limiting your contribution to climate change requires an adapted diet, and coffee is no exception. Choosing a mode of coffee preparation that emits less greenhouse gas and moderating your consumption, meaning fewer cups, are part of the solution. The researchers at the University of Quebec wrote in their study. Okay, so according to researcher Bjorn Lumberg, people say that they go meatless for the environment and that studies have only ever been able to prove that going meatless saves something like less than 10%. So 90% of our diets are gonna be the same and meatless is probably about 10% less. Um, and I think that that's changing. Of as what? We Save what? Of your carbon footprint. So let's say my carbon footprint is a 10, whatever metric yeah. we're using, and a, a vegetarian would be a 9, right, of their carbon footprint. And I think that that's changing rapidly as we move towards seed oil-based foods. But nevertheless, if meat, right, can reduce a carbon footprint, and, uh, you know, again, I think that's debatable. Think about just the drink of coffee. It can't even be close to 1% when meat is probably the majority of people's diets. You see what I'm saying here? Right. It's so nominal. Could you argue that it would, sit, like a coffee-less diet is equivalent to such a lower carbon footprint than a coffee drinker's diet? No, it's ridiculous. It's um, remember, it's like- You know like, what it tells me? It's like when Boris Johnson in the UK told people to replace their, their tea kettles to help the environment because that, <laughs> really? How about not sending military, massive amounts of military equipment to Ukraine? That'll help maybe in some small measure if you really want to help things. But people's tea kettles, Boris Johnson, go ahead. I was just going to say what this tells me is drink more coffee because there's obviously something in it that's beneficial that they don't want you to have. <laughs> well, it, we know it. We I don't know. know about that. Well, we know it lowers heart disease. Um, but we also, and, yeah. again, Diuretic. according to Bjorn Lungberg, it is our number one source of pesticides. Yeah. Um, it is the one thing that we interact with the most that is most heavily sprayed with pesticides. So, it, you know, let's yeah. not lose our heads here and just say because they don't want us to have it, we want it. I see your comments when you guys <laughs> write that. It makes me laugh, but we have to be a little smarter than that. So they argue that filtered coffee, by the way, is the biggest contributor of CO2. So the filtered coffee is the biggest. Yeah, that instead of filtered, you'd be doing the earth a favor by just using those mass-produced, like, Keurig, Keurig coffee pods, which are, the, which are the worst. But you drink them, honey. Quote, I don't drink Keurig. I, I refuse. I, that stuff's garbage. <laughs> you don't refuse any no, I'll, I'll eat. I'll, I'll drink some bad gas station filtered coffee any day of the week over a Keurig pod. Anyway, anyway, so let me just get back to my story here. Quote, the entire point of the study is to tell us that coffee production causes climate change. Why? Because of CO2 emissions. And Al Gore, of course, warned us uh, 20 years ago that rising CO2 levels cause a warming of the earth, with, which then, of course, leads to heat waves. It leads to raging hurricanes. It leads to famines. Right? That's the point they're getting to with all of this. The, the, the carbon footprint piece is just one piece of the story. But, of course, we want to reduce the carbon footprint because of raging hurricanes, heat waves, famines. Inequity around the world, total devastation. So let's look at these and see if they're correct. You've probably seen a lot of headlines like this over the past few years. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, like, oh, heat waves are causing mass death across Europe. The, you know, uh, heat waves are, are killing people all through, in, you know, Italy, whatever. You, I'm sure you've seen a ton of those uh, headlines. But nothing could be further from the truth. Heat waves haven't increased at all. In fact, they've been about the same or decreased for decades. Take a look at this. This is the U.S. annual heat wave index. Notice anything odd about it? 
to go back to 1930, as we talked about last night on the show, for this type of that behavior. As climate researcher we Alex... We bumped into the sun in the night... <laughs> Sorry, did we bump into the sun in 1930? What the hell is that spike? <laughs> exactly. Look at that. But it hasn't been a problem for that long. And actually, As, there are climate researchers now who have amazing technology at how to warn populations at risk for heat waves. Um, they can see it coming, and they have uh, throughout India and other extremely hot places. Again, I refer you to Judith Curry's great book on this. So as climate researcher Alex Epstein writes, even though Earth has gotten 1% or 1 degree Celsius warmer in the last century, deaths from cold outnumber deaths from heat by 5 to 15 times. Cold is more dangerous than heat on every continent. Take a look at this. Even in especially hot countries, such as India, cold-related deaths significantly exceed heat-related deaths. In fact, even with a slight warming of the Earth, according to the data from the Lancet, look at this. It saves 166,000 lives per year. Warming does. Fewer cold deaths as a result. So in other words, if they could prove that humans are warming the Earth with CO2 emissions, which they can't, then it's actually saving lives not killing people. I agree with Graham Keegan, who posted this on X. Um, drinking coffee causes a lot of CO2 emissions, apparently. I didn't know this. I will now drink a lot more coffee. I agree. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel about it. <laughs> so when someone tries to claim that heat waves are on the rise, show them this video. Share this with them. Because heat waves are on the rise because of CO2 emissions. Uh, both statements are false. You know, or that heat waves are on the rise because of CO2 emissions or that heat waves are even on the rise. Both statements are false. Now, what about hurricanes and storms? Roger uh, Pilkey Jr., a political scientist and professor who studies these models at the University of Colorado Boulder, um, has a running chart of storms in the United States that make landfall. The red line data shows these storm frequency is going down or flat. Look at the red line in the middle of the screen, the, the red dotted line. But it's certainly not going up. So it might be flat. It's going down, but certainly not going up, as he explains. Take a listen. The United Nations, for instance, predicted that we would get a 40% increase in disasters between 2015 and 2030. So still seven years to go. Do you believe them? That's an unfortunate uh, abuse of statistics. Uh, they took a data set that uh, shows an increase in disasters because of better reporting around the world from the 1970s. And they drew a line through it uh, and extended it to 2030. Uh, the reality is that since 2000, the, the number of global disasters has been, been flat or slightly declining, which is really good news. It means that the world is doing better with respect to disasters. Disasters require a combination of an exposed population, vulnerability, and an extreme event. Um, so when, when we look for trends in climate, we should always look at climate data not disaster data. Hmm. So what about famines? Well, according to the UN Refugee Agency, uh, famines, the number one cause of famines, yeah, they say it here, is wars and conflict, the primary drivers of famine. As we've long said here at Redacted, wars cause famine. Yeah, they say that. Here in Somalia, people are starving. Never mind that we're bombing them and destroying their crops and irrigation options, but it's climate change here in Somalia. That's responsible for the shorter rainy seasons. Okay, even if that were true, there's zero evidence that human beings have anything to do with it. Or that it's not just part of some normal Earth cycle. Oh, and by the way, Wall Street knows this, by the way. So Wall Street has been betting big against climate alarmism. I love this. I find this part of the story fascinating. A new report out this morning shows that Wall Street hedge funds made billions last year betting that big disasters caused by climate change wouldn't happen, would not happen. Wall Street bet against climate-related disasters, and they made a lot of money betting against it. They've been looking at the same data that we've presented here to you tonight. And not the stuff that the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, and the mainstream media try to spin. Look at this. Hedge funds got a big boost from betting against disasters. And they say... In this piece, we've all seen the headlines about how extreme weather events are becoming more frequent and more disastrous, but one group is surprisingly optimistic that the worst catastrophes won't happen. 
Hedge funds. A record $16 billion in catastrophe bonds were issued in 2023. Top hedge funds snapped them all up, which helped them reach historic profits, according to Bloomberg. What are these cat catastrophe bonds? They're insurance-linked securities that pay out huge returns if a natural disaster doesn't happen. They put up the collateral to be used if the disaster occurs, but then gets it back if it doesn't, and it earns interest along the way. I find that hilarious. So it's like, well, does this sound like the, the most disgusting game of craps ever? Like, that's almost <laughs> sinister that that even exists. Well, that's you Wall know? Street for <laughs> like, you. I mean, what the hell? think about credit default swaps, betting on the collapse of the housing market. Yeah. I mean, this is what Wall Street does, right? So they're betting against these disasters. They're saying, and Wall Street puts up these bonds because we think they're going to happen. ESG and whatever else. And these, these companies, these big hedge funds are like, nope, we're looking at this data. We don't think something big is going to happen this year caused by humans and climate change. Now, before we go back to something that uh, Hubert Keller said at the WEF, which in our view is a very pro-farmer, pro-coffee grower statement. He spoke about the need to basically pay these farmers a lot more money without charging the consumers more for a cup of coffee. He said they only make 10% of the profits for their hard work. And the big corporations make most, if not all, of the profits. Like the upstream, downstream variation here is so out of whack that the farmers make nothing. So I was stunned. He actually said this at a World Economic Forum. He was pro-farmer, wanting to keep them in business, improve their land, and also make us, the consumers, not pay more for the cup of coffee. Like and there's, he says, there's a system in place that we can do all of that. Listen. You know, there is a, a great nature opportunity around coffee. If we move on to the economics of coffee, it's a roughly a 250 billion market globally. But what is really interesting is that less than 10% of this value goes to the growers. And by the way, um, coffee grower is not, um, is, is a, you know, most of coffee growers live below the poverty line. And it's an incredibly fragmented um, uh, industry. So there's a lot of money to be made along the line and it doesn't all have to go to the big companies and so forth that the farmers should be making an equitable amount of money and you can do that with regenerative regenerative farming providing biodiversity on these soils so that they're not killing off the soils but then making sure that that money is being reinvested and he believes that that can actually happen so you know we want to give him credit for saying that but he said something crazy about climate change and your cup of coffee is contributing to climate change at the beginning. Uh, but he did say that about farmers. So to be fair and equitable, that's what we try to do here. So let us know your thoughts on this. Um, are you okay to give up your cup of coffee or reduce the amount of coffee you drink? For those folks at the World Economic Forum, let us know in the comments below. I really hope you enjoyed watching this video. You know, YouTube thinks that you'll actually like this next video right here. It's personalized based on your own viewing habits. So if you watch the video, please leave a comment. Let us know what you think about it. And we will see you next time, everyone.